there is anything excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. We got a lot of talent in this church, don't we? Yeah, give them a hand, give these folks a hand for sharing their gifts with us. Uh, it's uh, August, it's uh, family church month because two things. One, we wanted to allow our Sunday school teachers to worship <laughs> during the summer. But also, it's good for us as parents to have our young people with us in worship. And so to, to model for them what worship is and what worship happens. And I think this is a great example of that as we share our gifts with God. And so I'm thankful for all the different ways that young people help us lead the church. And that's what we've been calling here at Glenmark called sticky faith. We want our faith. When these young people graduate from high school, go off to college, we want them to take their faith with them. And we know one of the best ways to do that is to integrate them into the life of all the church. And not just kind of say, hey, go to Sunday school and stay over there. But we want to integrate youth in the life of our church and be intergenerational. So I love that we're doing that this month in a little way. And I'm actually, uh, the young, younger kids, um, some of you young kids who are here this morning, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite you up a little bit later when we gather around the communion table. And I'm going to give a little time with the kids. So I'm just going to let you think about that. So at the end of the sermon, I'm going to invite young people, any young people that want to come up around the communion table, get a behind-the-scenes look at communion this morning, you can come up here with me. I'll do that later, just to start thinking about it now. So now, for the sermon. That wasn't the sermon. You knew, hopefully, you know, just making sure I get enough time. All right. So I, anybody really an NBA f- basketball fan here? Any NBA basketball? Some NBA fans. All right. I'm more of a college basketball person. But I do kind of, you know, watch and keep up with the Washington Wizards, which used to be, does does anybody know where the Washington Wizards used to be? What city? The Baltimore Bullets, then became the Bullets in the Washington, now they're the Washington Wizards. And they've been doing pretty good the past few seasons, would you say? I mean, they made it to playoffs, right? If you've known that, if you follow sports news, they've been pretty good. But I will tell you that if you didn't know this, the Wizards used to not be very good at all. They had some really bad years, and one of the worst years was in 2009, not because of the of their of the team, but because the team made the news, the national news, because of an altercation that occurred between uh, Gilbert Arenas, who was one of the star players, and another guy named Javaris Crittenton. Evidently, they got off the plane from a game. They were in the shuttle from the plane back home, and they got into an argument over a gambling debt. And they threatened to bring guns to practice the next day. And lo and behold, they showed up at practice the next day, and both of them brought guns to practice, giving new name to the Washington Bullets, which instead of the Wizards, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah, but um, bump. Where is my drummer over here, Kyle? Uh, he disappeared. So, um, but here's what happened. This is actually, uh, Karan Butler wrote a book, and he was there in the locker room when this happened. And, and uh, he, he, he described it this way, that Gilbert Arenas came to practice and he lined up four handguns in his shelf on his locker. And he, when, when Crittenden walked into the locker room, he said to Crittenden, which one do you want to get shot with? That's what he said. And then Crittenden said, well, how about this one? He pulled out a handgun and aimed it at Gilbert Arenas in the locker room. And all of a sudden, everybody else in the locker room froze. Everybody else in the locker room was on high alert, and they were like, what is happening? Why is this happening? What is going on? And in this middle altercation, Karan Butler then stepped in, and he says that he talked Crittenton down, and he said, look, this isn't right what you're doing. What you guys are doing is not right. What you guys is happening, you need to accommodate. You're going to lose your career. You're going to lose your everything, your family. You're disrupting the team. This is not good for you. This is not good for us. It's not good for anybody. You need to stop this. And fortunately, they listened to Butler, and they both put their guns away, and they went on to practice. Well, thanks to the media, we now know what happened in that locker room. And, thanks, and when it got out, then the NBA stepped in, and they suspended both players. Uh, Gilbert Arenas lost $7.6 million in salary. He was later traded to another team. Crittenton never played another game in the NBA. So this altercation, this, this conflict within the team was just exemplified of the team. I mean, it's just part of the symptoms of a team that was struggling. And 
See, the point is this is not so much about the conflict, but do you want to guess what their team record was that season in 2009? They went 26 wins, 56 losses that season. Not their worst record, but one of their worst records. They had multiple bad years because there was no team chemistry. And without team chemistry, without team unity, you can't have a winning team. That's just fact. That's just basic common sense. And so why Butler was so wise to step in and say, you guys need to stop this. You need to get a handle on this because this just doesn't affect you guys. This affects the whole team. And we can't be a winning team if you guys are going to do this. It's exactly what Paul is saying to the church in Philippi. Saying to Euodia and Syntyche, if you all can't figure this out, if you guys can't get along, if you can't solve your problem, I'm going to send somebody in to help you solve that problem, but we can't have this happening in the church. You need to figure this out. Because the church can't be a winning team if you guys keep arguing about stuff. And so he actually sends in another person to step in and say, solve this problem in the church so that we can be the church. Solve this problem so we can get back to the mission of the church. And Paul actually says, this and he's actually repeating something from chapter 2 about what it means to be the church and what it means to be a Christian. The first thing he says in that passage says, Be of the same mind. He's saying, Be of the same mind. Both, both not only Euodia and Syntyche, but all of you in the church need to be of the same mind. What is he talking about? Well, he's actually talking about what he already said in chapter 2. Let me remind you, because I know we didn't read it this morning. He said, This, be of the same mind having the same love, being in full accord uh, and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to, to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. And then Paul goes on to talk about how Jesus left heaven to come to earth, took on the human form, not only became a human, but became a criminal and gave his life on a cross. He talks about the path of greatness being through humility, and that is the mind of Christ. So when he says to them, be of the same mind, he's actually reminding them, be of the mind of Christ. Humble yourselves, look out for the interests of each other, not just for your own interests. I think about how often in the church, we get hung up on personal preference, self-interest, rather than the interest of Christ, rather than the mission of Jesus Christ. I've seen it in so many different churches, so many different places. I've seen people argue and be disunified and not have the same mind over things that have nothing to do with the mission of Christ, with the mind of Christ. That have nothing to do with loving people and being about the mission of reaching people in the world and serving the world and praising God, growing disciples. There, we get off mission when we get hung up on our self-interest and our personal preferences. I've seen it when it comes to chairs. You know, should we have these chairs that we can move around, have cushions on them, or should we have pews? I've seen it over color, on paint colors on walls. I like the teal, not the aqua, you know. Uh, I've seen it on carpeting. I've seen it on, should we have a stained glass window, not have a stained glass window? Uh, Music style, right? We all have different personal preferences on musical style, and we argue over whose musical style is better for the church and better for worship. Personal preference, folks. So all those self-interests actually take us away from the mission of Jesus Christ. Those are all personal preferences that you and I have for different things in the church, but they don't matter when it comes to the mind of Christ, the mission of Christ. What we're called to be in the world and called to do in the world. Or I'm jealous of some of you that get to wear shorts to church in summer, right? Attire, sometimes we get hung up on attire, what people wear to church, and when, when, did, when did Jesus say, hey, start judging people on what they wear to church? Is, is that really the mind of Christ? <laughs> is that really the mission of Christ? I mean, it may be a personal preference. We all may have our own ideas, and there's nothing wrong with having those opinions and ideas. The problem is when they become the main thing. When they become what the church is about and not the mission of Christ. 
when we start to make something else a priority over the mission of Christ. So we as a church are to be of the same mind, and that mind is the mind of Christ who humbled himself, gave himself, and provided the mission and loved people in the world. So that's the same mind we're to have. The other thing that Paul says is that, in summary, basically in that second section, he says, be, and this is my interpretation, my translation of summary, is be a non-anxious presence. You know, pray about everything, everything, with thanksgiving, right? So be a non-anxious presence. So how many people here, anybody like to fly southwest? Yeah, right? I like southwest because I like a little control over my seating arrangements. So I'm always like the guy who does the early bird check-in. I want to get the A group, you know, because I know if I can get into like A1 through 30, you know what I'm talking about, southwest people? So you can line up, right? I want to make sure because I want to get the exit row. Because on most Southwest planes, there's a seat in the exit row where there's no seat in front of you, and you can stretch out your legs. That's my seat, folks. <laughs> I have tri- I've learned the tricks of the trade to get that seat. So you've got to get in the A group. You also notice that the st- whoever is the steward there, the airline attendant, he or she will stand in that row when you walk on the plane. And most people just walk on by because they don't want to interrupt the steward. But I go right up to them. I say, can I sit there? Because I know they're going to be standing there. Sure enough, they're like, they get out of my way and I go sit down, right? Little trick of the trade if you fly southwest. All right. Because most people pass that by. Some of you may already know that. But there's a, there's a commitment you have to make to sit in that row. And the commitment is this. They come to you in the middle, before they even, the plane takes off, and you have to commit to being a servant. You have to commit to opening the exit door and serving everybody else on the plane to help them out of the plane. That means you cannot run screaming out of the plane, ah, the plane's on fire, right? You cannot do that. You have to, you are committing to be a non-anxious presence on that plane and open that exit door for everybody else and help everybody else out of that plane. You are making a commitment when you sit in that seat, not just to have leg room, but to serve people. And they come to you and they eyeball you and look you in the eye, and you have to say out loud, yes, I will do that. If you give them, well, yeah, sure, why not? They're like, out of here, right? When you sit in the seat, when you sit in the seat of a Christian, when you sit in the church, You have made a commitment to be a non-anxious presence to serve people. To open the exit door to freedom and forgiveness in Jesus Christ. You and I are a non-anxious presence. And and, and he goes on and he describes how that happens. How do you be a non-anxious presence in a world that is sometimes going down in flames? How do you be this non-anxious presence when everything is falling apart? Well, he says, pray about everything with thanksgiving. And then he says, then the promise, he says, and the peace of God will guard your heart. Now, now here's what Paul says, that literally he says, when he says guard your heart, that's what what that means is to take a whole army and garrison it in a a walled city. So you, you would take a whole army and you would put it in the city and you would garrison it in the heart of the city and how would that make everybody feel in the city when that army arrived? How would, if you lived in a city, a walled city, that was, always was susceptible to attack, if you lived in that walled city and you knew there was this mighty army residing in your city, how would you then feel when the army showed up? How would you feel? Safe, right. Would you have more peace? Yes, right. What Paul is saying is that the peace of God, God's presence, will garrison itself inside of your heart in such a way that whatever the external circumstances are of your life, you will have confidence. Now notice that it doesn't say if you have enough faith, you won't have anything bad happen. You won't have any attack. That's not what that says. It says that God will reside in your heart. You will experience peace and confidence in God that will be bigger because that army is bigger than the boogeyman, so to speak, right? But notice that Paul is not talking about perceived threats. 
You know, a lot of times you and I have anxiety and worries about things that never happen, right? We worry about things that don't won't occur. Paul is actually talking about real threats to the church and to people, talking about persecution. So he's saying there is a real threat in the world, and what he is saying is if you will pray about those, give those to God, and allow God's peace to garrison itself in your heart, you will have more confidence in facing those real threats in your life. Doesn't mean they go away, doesn't mean they get solved, but you can experience the peace of God. I'm not saying it's easy, folks. But there is a level. And in fact, the Psalmist 122, I read this psalm in my devotions this week. It says, they do not fear bad news. They confidently trust the Lord to care for them. It doesn't mean the bad news goes away. It doesn't mean that the world isn't falling apart. It doesn't mean that bad things isn't, aren't going to happen. It means that there is a confident trust and faith that brings peace in the midst of danger, in the midst of problems, in the midst of difficulty and adversity. Paul knows this best. He was persecuted, beaten, tortured, jailed, shipwrecked, and he was able to say, I find myself to be content in all circumstances. The peace of Christ guarded his heart. I don't know about you, but I'd love to have that kind of peace. I would love to experience, and there are times when I have experienced that kind of peace, and I just need more of it. So that's the promise of God. So be a non-anxious presence because of your confidence in God, because God is garrisoned in your heart. And then the other thing that Paul says as he wraps this up, he's, basically my summary is this, be positive. I'm not talking about blood type. Where's my drummer? Where is my drummer? <laughs> So, talking about being positive, see, because the temptation of the church and the temptation of Christians is to look at all the bad news in the world, to look at the world that's falling apart, and we got a lot of that going on these days, to look at the world around us and go, oh my, oh my, there is nothing good in the world around us, so let's just lock the doors and pray. Paul is saying that is not what the church is to do because, first of all, that's not the mission of Christ. That's not the mind of Christ. But he's basically saying we don't huddle up, withdraw, cloister ourselves off. We've got to stay looking at the world in a positive way. Even though it is falling apart, there is sin, there is brokenness, we can still see good in the world and in the other people because God created this world. As broken as it is, there is still good in the world. So don't run from it. There is still good in people that don't even agree with us because they are created in the image of God. There's a plaque that hangs in my house when you walk into my house. This was a gift from a friend here at Glenmar, and she gave this plaque to me when I first came here, and it's a quote from Erasmus. Y'all know Erasmus, right? You, You, right? Some of you are not, and I'm, I'm proud of you. If you know who Erasmus is, I, I, you're in good shape, right? Now, Erasmus was a Catholic priest during something that is very important. Actually, this year we're celebrating the 500th anniversary of what? Reformation, right? Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther nailed 95 theses to the Wittenberg door in Germany and said, here's what we need to change in the church Erasmus was a teacher in the church, a a Catholic priest who was also teaching very similar things to Martin Luther. He just never left the Catholic church. He stayed within the Catholic church to try and reform the Catholic church. Martin Luther left the church to reform in a different way. But Erasmus said this. This was a quote from Erasmus. He says, this is Latin, since we're talking about the Philippians who spoke Latin. It says, bidden or not bidden, God is is present. Bidden or not bidden, God is present. What that means is whether or not you acknowledge God, God's present. Whether or not you acknowledge God, you are created in the image of God, whether you believe it or not. When you walk into the world and go into the world around you, whether or not you believe it or think it or even doubt it, God is present. Whether you acknowledge God or not, God is present in you and in the world. I take that as good news. Because there are times where I think God is nowhere around. 
But this reminds me that God is. <laughs> In fact, God is more present and close to us than we can imagine. So close, we miss it, right? All right, and that's what Paul's saying, that there's, you can still look at the world and see things that are excellent and praiseworthy and pure and just and good. You can see good in others. I, in fact, I had an experience just recently with an atheist, a young woman who was an atheist, and we were having it. She knew I was a pastor, a Christian. She was an atheist, and we were having a discussion. And, and, and uh, even though we didn't share sa- the, the same view, right, about God, I found that in our discussion, we shared a lot of common values. And so when I talked to her, even though I was in disagreement with her perspective on the world, she and I actually shared a lot of good values. And there were things that I could affirm in her as an atheist because she wanted to do some good in the world and do some good and live a good life and things like that. So I could say, yeah, that's, that's good, that's praiseworthy, that's excellent in you. And I could affirm that in her even though she looked and believed differently than me. Does that make sense? So I could see the image, and here's the thing, that she could not, she's not going to agree with this statement if I, if I had her here, but here's what my interpretation of that. She is created in the image of God. So therefore, because she is created in the image of God, she can bear the goodness of God, just as you and I can. That's why people scratch their heads, well, they don't believe in God and they're good people. Exactly, because they're created like everybody else in the image of God. I would also say they're also sinful people. They also sin. They also have brokenness in their life. Nobody's perfect, right? But all of us bear the image of our Creator whether we acknowledge God or not. Whether we bid and talk to God or believe in God or not, the image of God is in each of us. And so that's why we can do that. So that's what Paul's saying. When you look out the world, don't run from the atheist. Don't run from the, the brokenness. Don't run from those things. Seek and to be positive, to see good in the places where you feel like there's no God because the world is created by God. So really what Paul is saying to us as Christians and as the church is that we're to to be gentle and of the same mind, not adversarial with one another. We're to be trusting and confident in God when the world is falling apart around us. We are to be appreciative and see the good around us and in the world even when things are not going well. What Paul is talking about is a way of being the church, being a Christian. I'm not talking about doing Christianity. We're, we're real good at human, you know, we've mentioned this before, we're real good at doing church. Paul's describing how to be the church, how to be a Christian. That's attitudinal. That's a perspective. That's internal. Now, I promised myself I wouldn't talk about my vacation in Glacier National Park this morning. And I broke my promise. I got to camp by this lake called Cosley Lake. And I was about, if you, you can see kind of the shoreline on the right, or yeah, well maybe you can't see it, sorry, I can see it in that screen. All right, so on that, so where you're looking at, I am like 10, 10 feet to the right of that picture. My tent is set up 10 feet from that. And I could look out, that's a morning shot of the lake. And I, what do you notice about the, 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 uh, the lake itself? What do, you, what do you see about the water? What's happening with the water of this lake? It's, it's calm, dead calm, still, right? So I woke up at 4 a.m. that night we camped, and I couldn't go back to sleep because I was on East Coast time, I guess, still on East Coast time. We were in mountain time. So I woke up at 4 a.m., couldn't go back to sleep, and everybody else was sleeping. I thought there were bears, but it was just people. So I got up. And I got out and I walked out to the shore of this lake because I wanted to see the stars in their splendor. And I sat there on the shore of that lake for quite some time and the Milky Way galaxy was just full out. I mean, I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but you got to get out in the mountains to see the whole thing, right? But when the lake is that calm, you know what you see in the reflection of that lake? The Milky Way galaxy. And when I sat there, 
I experienced peace. I could not, the only word that could describe that moment was peace. God's peace. And when Paul says, or even when Jesus said to the storm, peace, be still, Matthew says that when Jesus commanded the wind and the waves, when after that command went out, there was dead calm on the lake. Dead calm like that. I thought the storm just went away, but there was a stillness. Folks, when our hearts are as still as that lake and the light of Christ shines in our hearts, guess who we reflect? When our hearts are at peace and still and confident in God and Christ's light shines into you and me, guess what the world sees in us? The light of Christ. The mind of Christ. It comes through God's peace. In Jesus Christ. Amen.